Hi, everyone. Hi, thanks for having us, Rory. We're really excited to speak about some user testing methods today. Um, like you mentioned, we're speaking to mixing methodologies. So we all know there's a lot of different ways to go about user testing. Um, we think that all of them have their value and place um, in building a really high quality product. So we're gonna look at what they are, why each type of testing is valuable, and then how you implement that both at the design team level and then at the organizational level. So um, I'm Charlotte Cunningham. I'm a product designer with a company called Crafted. Aaron Knoll, product designer, also Crafted. Great. Uh, TJ Bowen, um, 10 years of product uh, development experience. So I'm, I come from the product side. And the three of us all work at Crafted, a product development consultancy, where we believe that balanced teams of designers, engineers, and product working in tight collaboration and quick iterations uh, representing like, you know, the UX perspective, feasibility, and business viability um, is the best way to build great products. All right, jumping into the content, um, why should you listen to us? Why, I'm sure we've all got experience with user testing. What insights are we bringing to the table? So from a consultancy, we bring a really unique perspective in that we've had the chance to bring positive impacts across a really wide range of industries. We've seen everything from startups to Fortune 200s and how implementing user testing goes at all the different levels from legacy tech stacks to greenfield products. And across all of those, we've been able to deliver quality results with measurable positive impacts on whatever project we're working on. So some examples of this are we had the chance to work with a really extensive A-B testing system at one client, um, and we saw the chance to deliver up to a 10% increase in purchase or conversion rate through a single test. And that was a really great example of quantitative testing um, at the enterprise level and how that brings value. Um, at another smaller company, they did um, job onboarding and um, recruitment. And through user feedback, we were able to identify a completely overlooked pain point in the user journey. Um, that was the main contribution to user drop-off, which was one of the primary KPIs. And through that, we were able to early on reiterate, re, um, steer the project in a new direction that we knew would um, bring the results we were hoping to find. And then combining contextual studies and analytics tracking, we've also reduced abandonment for a nonprofit application that initially took three plus hours, required multiple sessions, and we brought it down to 25% compared to that previous year. So that's just some examples of the great results we've seen user testing, both qualitative and quantitative bring across our experiences. And we're hoping to share that with you all today. Um, anything to add from you two before we move to the next slide? Let's roll. Perfect. Um, I'll let TJ speak to why should your business listen to us? Sometimes the hardest thing to get buy-in for is from the larger organization on user testing. Great. Yeah, so sometimes the perspective of a business might be, hey, why should we invest money and resources into testing, both qualitative or quantitative or both? Um, you know, what's in it for us? And so the perspective here is that um, at the beginning of an initiative, the risk and uncertainty is very high. Um, and so decisions made early on can really make a big impact, positive or negative, in the direction and outcome of um, your undertaking. And so the better information that you have, um, especially in the form of quantitative and qualitative research, the better decisions you're going to make early on before you're investing a lot of money like development time into the initiative. Um, so it's just really essential for the organization to invest appropriately in research. And so people often ask like, where does quantitative and qualitative fit into the process? Many of us have probably pitched to our stakeholders, our clients, the uh, British Design Council's famous double diamond. Oftentimes there's a misconception that maybe qualitative or quantitative, qualitative especially, only has a place on the left-hand side of things. As you're going to kind of see, like in our case studies, you know, my pitch, our pitch is that qualitative and quantitative loops appear it throughout the process. They're not just for problem discovery, but they're also for vetting your solutions and continuing to test your product once it's out there. So if you've shown someone this diamond, you can say testing everywhere, every part of it. 
All right, so now you've seen the high level value of testing, getting down into the methodologies here of qualitative versus quantitative. How are we defining the difference? So everyone has their own approach here, but for us, quantitative is data-driven and data-driven testing. So it's whenever we use numbers to make design or business decisions. So you can collect quantitative data about a lot of different areas. It can be populations, um, user behaviors, key performance indicators. Um, and some examples of quantitative testing are traditional A-B testing, when you have like a green button and a red button, you wanna see which one people click more. Um, it can even be multivariant testing. You've got a lot of different colors, so you wanna see what people click more. And maybe you see like warm tone colors, people click more because it aligns with your brand. Um, some tools for quantitative testing is Optimizely, which lives, um, integrates with your website, performs web analytics. Um, Full Story is another web analytics tool that also helps with visualization of that data. But you can even go down to the granular level of surveys or impression testing and do really um, affordable, quick methods of getting some data on your concepts. Qualitative is the flip side of that. So it's anything that is not number driven. So this can be feedback directly from actual or potential users. Um, so sometimes you have to approach a theoretical user base. Sometimes you have access to your actual user base and both can bring a lot of value. Um, and this can include a, lot, a variety of methods to understand attitudes, beliefs, motivations. Those are the sort of things you measure with qualitative testing. And some tools we see here a lot are user interviews are usually what comes immediately to mind for qualitative testing, but those can often be expensive or time intensive. But so qualitative testing also includes things like surveys, diary studies, contextual studies, or even unmoderated user testing can bring a lot of great insights. So that is the what they are. And it really is uh, one plus the other equals success, right? So we might perhaps know that quantitatively someone is dropping out of the funnel 50% at this moment in the process. But the why is really key for us understanding, is this a moment that is only happening here, the intersection of a user's motivation plus the appearance of this page is causing this interaction? Or is there something more generalizable here that we could be applying elsewhere and throughout the application. So the what is informative, but the why helps us see opportunities for potentially reusing this learning elsewhere. And that's why I kind of pitch like, you know, suggest like these two things really work in tandem. And it's when you combine the two that you're really able to say that learning can be used elsewhere throughout the application and we might be able to reduce drop off in future funnels because we've done this. Great. And just to reinforce from the business perspective, um, having both the what and the why um, behind behavior is just the most efficient way and effective way of driving decisions and reducing cost at the end of the day. Um, it's also great to provide engineers and other stakeholders um, both perspectives, um, quant and qual. Uh, sometimes stakeholders lean in towards one or the other, depending on their perspective. Um, so having both is, in my opinion, not just most effective to see both sides of things for the from the product perspective, but stakeholders are also um, reveal different perspectives from utilizing both. All right, so jumping into some examples, how do these two methodologies combine at an actual company in a real use case? So here is an example from a client that we were recently on. Um, this is something we actually did and implemented and saw great success with. Um, like everything in design, it's a circle. It is continually feeding into itself and improving itself. Um, so starting with some context on this client, they were a large corporation, so at this higher level, and they hosted personal blogs and placed their own e-commerce CTAs on those blogs related to the content. So starting here, we got some qualitative user feedback from those blog owners that informed us of an potential improvement opportunity here. And their complaint was that the e-commerce CTAs that were related to the blog content, but not owned by them, were taking up too much room. They were big, they were bulky, um, they could be slimmed down. 
So with that feedback, we jumped into a quantitative A-B test. Um, we designed several different versions of slimmer, more modern buttons. And we wanted to see how those would feed into our primary KPI, which was increasing conversion rate from these CTAs. So hopefully by slimming that down, meeting that user request, we would improve those conversion rates um, and modernize the platform. Uh, what happened though is our new modern buttons, um, the very, we did not expect the results we got there. So we had the what of the data and the winner was one that we didn't really think would win. And we were like, but why is that happening? So that's when we jumped back into qualitative testing. So we had a big why question that we needed answered. So for this, we did the traditional user interviews where we presented um, potential users with our designs and we asked them which one they preferred and learned why they preferred the one that the A-B testing had indicated. So what was great is that we were getting the same feedback from the qualitative that we were in the quantitative, that one of the variants was the big preference, the overall winner, everyone preferred it um, for the reasons that it was easier to read, it was bigger. And so then we were able to take those learnings and feed them into future quantitative A-B tests where um, the button style that won, we were able to apply it across the platform and then further increase um, conversion right there. So um, I might have given it away a little bit, but here is our test. So on the left, we had the current design, the big buttons. You can see they're blocking a lot of the content. And then on the right, we have all of the modern slimmer buttons that follow a lot of existing concepts, existing practices, and they took up a lot less room on the page. So like I mentioned, people preferred the bigger buttons here. Um, we saw drastic decreases in not only conversion rate, but also click rate of the modern buttons, which surprised us all. We thought they would they were smaller, they were more modern, pe thought people would trust them more. And then when we went to do those user interviews, like I mentioned, people really liked the big buttons, even though they were clunky because they were easier to see and easier to read. So, um, and then, yeah, so I'll let TJ speak to how that then translated to some of the business initiatives following this test. Great. Yeah. So understanding why this test failed was really, really helpful um, from the business perspective, because if we didn't know why, then we probably would have leaned into the icon approach. Um, so one of the compromises in the design um, being shown is you have like big buttons that are easy to read and easy to press, or you have um, icons. And we thought, we really thought icons would make a difference um, in the performance. Um, so knowing why, knowing that the icons weren't helpful and that the users preferred the larger buttons prevented us from investing a lot more resources into testing different icons or icons in different places. Um, so we were able to just um, kind of cease that uh, train of effort and switch gears onto something else. And by the way, since this um, user testing was conducted several times, you know, every couple months, um, someone will have an idea of like, oh, why don't we put icons on these buttons? Um, and we're able to then confidently say, yeah, great idea. We tested this and um, we now have information from the users that um, this is just not as good as the larger buttons with the larger text. I'm going to share a, uh, another case study here. I hope you'll, uh, hopefully my storytelling is top notch because this deals with a lot of personal information. So I can't show the actual study, but I'll try to weave an interesting narrative through it. This study began with a tech impetus, which I think many of us are probably experiencing right now. Um, AI machine learning uh, has become more affordable, more accessible. The company had a hypothesis that if we had people spending less time manually researching people's backgrounds and more time sitting with them face to face, we could increase our conversion rate. We already knew that face to face interactions were critical for this company. So we wanted to get our people in front of more people faster. And we hypothesized machines. Well, machine learning could help us get there. Maybe ChatGPT could. Um, so we began with uh, just kind of uh, use, general user interviews, getting to know people's day-to-day, -day, and really 
one of the interesting insights that came out of that was one of the ultimate low points, you know, when they're doing research is if I find out the wrong thing about TJ and then I say it to him and our face-to-face interaction, that is ultimately a very embarrassing interaction for me, the person who wanted to meet with you. And these people were very risk averse to that. They were very nervous about that because that would likely result in, you know, not being able to convert this potential lead. But there was a tech impetus. So we took this insight and we were still going to go forge ahead with a pilot and see, could we provide some value and help these people to spend less time doing research? We leveraged our machine learning tool to begin surfacing data points collected on people. And we basically asked these people to continue doing their job as they always did. They would research this person and we tracked quantitatively, how often were they correcting data points that we were suggesting? And the answer was actually quite often. You know, it's really interesting, you know, from a machine learning model, you know, you say 80%, 90%, that is stellar from a statistically, we're able to get this information, but for these face-to-face interactions, people's threshold was much higher. They needed to be 99% sure. And when the computer said they were sure, that didn't align with their level of certainty. So then we, um, so, you know, the, the next step in this was we took that information on the quantitative study. We set up a qualitative diary study, which was basically we would check in with folks. They had to do this every day as part of their job. And we would just send them a study over Slack and say, hey, did you use the tool today? How was the data? And, um, you know, we kind of used a metaphor. We gave it a cute name. Like, would you hire the tool to join your team today? And people would say yes. They were like enthusiastic, like they're doing, it's doing a good enough job. They perceived that they would bring them onto the team. This followed further tech investment. We saw some positive data here. So we rolled out the tool. We rolled out an enhanced uh, integrated tool for surfacing these findings. And we just tracked how people would, um, we gave them two options. You could create a blank slate and start gathering the data individually, or you could start from this template that we, that you said you would hire, that we thought was really good. It was quantitatively pretty accurate from a machine learning standpoint. And over time, uh, people just trended back to the manual. And so, you know, to kind of get back to, what TJ was saying, like, what is some of the value of these cycles? We saved the business an immense amount of money and investment in this tool that we found that these recruiters would not use because the ultimate decider was, I wanted to ensure that I had a positive interaction and I was confident in the information I was bringing to that face-to-face engagement. So the business involved uh, invested in other ways to increase those amount of face-to-face connections rather than using machine learning. So maybe ChatGPT is not going to solve the world. I don't know. But um, interesting case study of how even a negative finding through this process can help positively affect your bottom line. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. All right, so now we've shown you the what they are, the value they hold, and how they're implemented at the actual organization level. Hopefully we've convinced everyone that doing qualitative and quantitative testing both is incredibly important and useful to any organization. But how can you actually implement this at your organization? Um, No matter what level of user testing you have, um, especially as a designer, I like to say you can always do more. So we're going to look at some of the outputs and implementations of these types of testing. So starting with qualitative, this one is always hard if you don't have existing practices. How do you measure qualitative outputs? You have all these different opinions and motivations and abstract information. How do you turn those into actionable, targetable insights? Um, It's not easy all the time. Uh, Oftentimes you have to adapt what you want to know to what you have learned. So some tools we have found really helpful are Miro. Um, You can see there using Miro, we took a bunch of insights from some user interviews and affinity bucketed them. 
And then by grouping them based off of some of our key questions, we were able to identify patterns from all of these different opinions. And that led us to, okay, for this behavior we were trying to observe, people are more often finding the thing we want them to find. So that's been successful. Or sometimes we'll see, hey, like people are oftentimes getting distracted by this thing over here and we don't want that to happen. How can we go fix that? And that becomes a next step to put into your backlog. So it's a lot of insights. Um, so you can see positive, negatives, neutrals. Sometimes people just really don't care about something you're really excited about. Um, negatives, sometimes people are performing an action you really don't want them to do. Um, but really how you have to format this is based off of what you're hoping to learn from that and then identifying the patterns that answer the questions and problems you're hoping to solve. Um, another example of that is down there, I just used a Google Sheet to do some heat mapping. We were trying to target really specific behaviors and seeing those colors helped us identify what behaviors were being performed, what behaviors weren't being performed. And that is a great support, especially if you have an extensive A-B testing system. Um, a great way to look at the why or the people aren't clicking on something. Um, we don't have numbers on that. So um, that is some of the literal outputs you can get there. You know, I think uh, Marin put it very succinctly. Think about the tool and think about it early. Um, qualitative research ops, I have found to be, you know, you know, is a is honestly one of the largest barriers I think to adoption in organizations that aren't already using qualitative research or aren't sharing it effectively. If you haven't used a tool like Dovetail, it's one I've used and I really enjoy it. There are other options out there. What it allows you to do is to share the entirety of a qualitative study, such as an interview or a video, a usability test, and you are able to tag it and share it with the larger organization. I fundamentally think that if we, were, if we are more effective at sharing our qualitative studies, it it enables the entire organization to more readily kind of see the value of the work we're doing, right? You've conducted a study with someone, you've interviewed um, a person, you've derived your insights, but that might actually be helpful to the uh, problem the sales team is searching down the line, uh, is uh, trying to solve down the line. You know, so again, qualitative research ops are a really effective way to help your organization kind of reuse and see the value of these sort of studies. All right, and then jumping to quantitative, the other side of the coin, um, quantitative outputs are a lot more, e a lot easier to understand and visualize um, because they are numbers. Um, and we are definitely not experts in data analysis. There are some great teams out there that specialize and focus on that and some great tools out there that focus on that. But um, here's a great example of some quantitative output that we didn't just get the winner from, but we were able to gain several other insights from these numbers. And if you're looking at this and confused by some of the language here, um, what we were testing was literally tree images. We were trying to increase the donations for a tree planting organization. And we were seeing what sort of image on the purchase page would help uh, motivate people to contribute to this organization most. So here we can see um, sapling B image people preferred the most. So that's sort of our clear winner there. But again, we don't know why, and that's maybe something we could go and do some qualitative testing or impression testing on. Um, and then at the very bottom, sapling D underperformed relative to all the other options. So, and then what we learned from that is we've got a winner, we've got a loser, and then um, there are no specific trends there. We have saplings at the top and bottom of the chart, and we were sort of testing um, baby trees, people planting trees, families with trees. And we didn't see any preference in terms of what the content was, which told us that it was the specific image we had found that was driving the most conversion. So this is just one example of quantitative output. You can get very in the weeds with all of these numbers, but um, it's a lot easier to measure and point to a winner and bring to your stakeholders saying, here's what we learned here are the numbers. So this is what a quantitative output looks like. 
Yeah. And quantitative research ops, I would say, are far more mature at the average organization, business intelligence tools. If you're working in an organization that has products, you might even have something. Even the most basic thing like Google Analytics is a solid foundation for this. Uh, this, this space is a little bit more mature, but there's other ways to kind of scale your quantitative research operations, mix panel, where you can configure funnels and derive and create right you know uh, simplified charts so people can see insights in real time scaling this is a is a little bit easier just because it is more mature and you know and if you're not even using google analytics i bet your organization has excel spreadsheets with some uh sort of data don't discount those as foundations for your for your quantitative research to maybe hopefully help kick off your next qualitative study All right, so we've seen some ops advice, but how can you start doing this? Wherever your organization's at, maybe you have extensive user testing and you're just motivated to go and do more. Maybe you haven't had the chance to do any user testing at your organization. Um, so how can you do this? Um, step one is always, what questions are you trying to answer? By identifying what hypotheses you are testing, this will inform what methods you were using. Are you trying to find the why of something? Are you trying to find the what of something? A little bit of both. Um, that'll really tell you what sort of testing you need to start looking into. And then to narrow in on that, um, knowing what your budget is for both time and cost. We've mentioned a few times that stuff like user interviews um, can be expensive, both in the time investment and the cost investment, depending on how much access to your user base you have. But um, there are definitely ways to do user testing, both qualitative and quantitatively, quickly and affordably. Um, one of my favorite tools to use is UserBob. Um, it's often overlooked. Not many people know about it, but it is incredibly affordable. They have a great range of testers to give you feedback. Um, it's unmoderated, so you just submit a prototype, let it out into the world, and then people go through, try to perform tasks, answer questions. So you could use that to do even one minute impression testing, comparing like version A to version B and seeing which one people perform a task on faster or better or whatever you happen to be looking for. Yeah. And, you know, short the, you know, the best advice for building up an, uh, you know, an ops program around this is start where you are, find out what analytics you might already have and use that to inspire a single conversation with a customer, start a couple, you know, you know, build up the habit make it make it a more recurring thing but it's it's okay to start small it doesn't have to be a fully scaled program with a beautiful dovetail and mix panel to be effective for helping to improve your product start where you are great and definitely find an ally in product um, as i've stated many times it's definitely worth the investment to get both the qual and the quant supporting decisions um, there's a strong roi and another note is to not give up. Um, sometimes if you just want to start talking with one or two customers, it could take a while to get a hold of customers based on some organizational barriers that might exist if it's not something that you regularly do. Um, Yep, design should not exist in a vacuum. Um, TJ has helped us get a lot of user testing, both performing the testing, getting buy-in for that from stakeholders, as well as getting those insights out into the larger organization. So this is a full team effort for sure. And it looks like we don't have much time for questions, but we're gonna throw this up here. Feel free to reach out to Crafted or to any of us on LinkedIn or other social medias. We are always happy to do virtual coffee or in-person coffee if you happen to be in the Denver area. Um, we love chatting with everyone and getting to know your stories at your companies. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, well, that was uh, really good. I, I think it tied in perfectly with Marin's talk as well. So it was, uh, it was a ni nice connection there. So thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Um, you're right. Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions, but I did have one um, that I'm going to post it into the Slack channel. And it, it comes back to kind of, you mentioned it a few times. Oh, we, we've already tested this and this is the answer. But sometimes technology changes. So I'm sure now, Aaron, if you try it with ChatGPT, it will work this time. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess the, the question I'll post in there is, when is the right time to revisit something? And how do you know when your research has gone stale? 
um, would be the yeah. kind of question. Great question. I'm on UXDX, so I'd be glad to, uh, I'll answer it on the channel there. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, just send them in and we'll we'll copy those onto the um, the, the Slack group as well. And Aaron, Aaron and the rest of the team, I'll invite them to, to make sure they, they answer them for you. So, but, but thanks. Thanks once again for sharing. Thank you all for having us. Yeah, Cheers. Thank you.